Good morning to all on this very chilly day. Dr. Trowbridge was not available today. My name is Sam Murray Boehner. I'm one of the chief residents, and I have the pleasure of introducing our speaker today, Dr. Joseph McBride, who will be giving grand rounds entitled Probiotics, Magic Pill or a Load of Waste? What does your gut say? Dr. McBride completed his medical school training at Loyola University in Chicago, followed by a combined internal medicine and pediatrics residency at Loyola and then traveled north to Madison to complete fellowships in both pediatric and adult infectious disease at the University of Wisconsin, and in 2017 joined the UW Division of Infectious Disease as a clinical instructor in both the Departments of Medicine and Pediatrics, and as of 2018 became a clinical assistant professor. He is also our UW Travel Medicine Clinical Preceptor and our UW Antimicrobial Physician Steward. Dr. McBride's CV shows a breadth and depth of interest in teaching, leadership, global health, and community service. He has received multiple teaching and leadership awards throughout his career. He has seven peer-reviewed publications, including a clinical problem-solving case in the New England Journal. He has 15 abstracts and is currently actively involved in research in HIV, blastomycosis, and antibiotic utilization on our campus. Beyond his published scholarly pursuits, he has given many regional and international presentations and has even been featured twice on our Channel 3000 News talking about raw water and flu shots. Dr. McBride clearly has a passion for community service and global health as well as he has participated in service including Hurricane Katrina relief, clinics in Guatemala, Cairo, Kenya, and Peru. With that, please join me in welcoming Dr. Joseph McBride. Hi, everybody. Good morning. Thanks for coming out. Um, what we're going to do today is an interactive Grand Rounds. So I still have a couple of pieces of information here on how to sign up for it. There's about 100 slots that are available to sign, and we can vote. Uh, the voting, there's really no right or wrong answers. A lot of this is just um, I'm curious about what the audience thinks about some of these questions, and that will be used as a springboard for some discussion. So feel free to uh, text WISC ID to this number, and then you'd be able to participate. All right, so probiotics, magic pill or load of waste, what does your gut say? So I have a few disclosures and disclaimers. Uh, the first is that the entirety of this talk discusses dietary supplements that are not evaluated by the FDA. Therefore, I will be exclusively referencing unlabeled and unapproved products for the entire discussion. Um, I'll have several different brand names of retail stores and brands of probiotics. I do not recommend any particular one over another. And I've got no financial disclosures to report. One other disclosure that I want to mention, and I think is important, is that I'm not really an expert in probiotic research. I have done zero publications in probiotics. I have uh, not worked in any kind of basic lab that analyzes probiotics. But what I am is an infectious disease clinician who prescribes a lot of antibiotics and I've had countless discussions with my patients about the risks and benefits of probiotics and should we use them. And I often find myself really struggling to answer their questions. And I suspect that I'm not the only person in the room that struggles with this. So my goal today is to really take a global view of probiotics. What are they? What are the choices that our patients face? How do we interpret some of this literature? And what are some of the problems in its interpretation? All right, so we're going to start off the bat right here. How would you describe yourself? Are you a probiotic believer? Are you a probiotic skeptic? Or are you kind of agnostic? Don't really care, don't really think too much about it. Yeah, I, you know, I think if, when I was kind of thinking through what people were going to be voting on, that is probably what I thought most of us would be kind of unclear, not really sure, not a really big proponent, not really a big uh, opponent of it either. So what statement reflects your knowledge about probiotics? Uh, the first one is, I've read the primary literature on probiotics, I feel comfortable making informed decisions. You don't really know the primary literature maybe, but you hear things between talking to other colleagues. You know that they exist, and that's pretty much it. And then lastly, you know, what are probiotics? Yeah, and I think that's also really fair. You know, we hear a lot in the lay press and the academic press um, about probiotics, but I don't think all of us really read that literature. 
Nevertheless, for the clinicians in the room, um, how frequently do you recommend probiotics? Are you doing it frequently, sometimes, rarely, uh, or never? Yeah, and, and I think this kind of middle ground that we're seeing in a lot of responses, again, reflects a lot of uncertainty that we have. Which probiotics do you recommend? Do you recommend a lactobacillus species, maybe a bifidobacterium species, or saccharomyces, a combination of them? Do you really say, just take anything, they're all pretty much the same? Or do you really just not recommend them at all? And... Yeah, anything. And, and I think I oftentimes myself uh, would do the same thing and say things like, well, find the cheap one. Find the one that's not going to cost you an arm and a leg. Uh, find one that's on sale. Uh, they're probably all the same. Good. All right. So here's our first case today. Um, we have a healthy 42-year-old female who presents to the internal medicine clinic with dysuria. She has a history of four postcoital UTIs over the last 10 years, and they were all treated with oral antibiotics. On one occasion, she had a vaginal yeast infection. Another time, she developed antibiotic-associated diarrhea. You diagnose her with a UTI, and you give her oral antibiotics. She asks if probiotics could be helpful in preventing her yeast infection and diarrhea. You say, yes. And then you recommend a specific brand, dose, frequency, and duration. Yes, I recommend probiotics, but really don't give any specifics. Maybe, either way, you can if you want to, whatever you feel like. No, and you say, there's conflicting data, I don't think they work, there are potential risks. Or do you, are you up front and honest and say, I don't, I don't really know. Yeah, that's C. That's, that's probably what I would oftentimes, maybe, if you feel really strongly about it. So she ultimately decides to go to try probiotics, and she goes to a local retail store. All right. At this local retail store, it's a big place. She goes, and she finds a ton of options there. How many options of probiotics do you think she's finding? None, three, six, ten, fifteen? So the point is, she walks into the store, she sees all these different varieties. How could she possibly pick? What kind of store has so many different options? Well, the answer is PetSmart, <laughs> okay? So she walked into PetSmart, and any of us can do this right now, and you can find 15 different probiotic varieties for your dog or cat. What if she went to a store designed for humans? If she went to GNC, there'd be 26 different probiotic varieties. If she went to Metcalf's, 48 probiotic varieties. If she went to Walgreens, pharmacy, 74. Target, 106. What if she went to Whole Foods? <laughs> any, any guesses? It's 189 probiotic varieties. And this is actually low, because I was just there a week or two ago, and I found a whole little aisle that I didn't even know was there. So it's probably over 200. And this just reflects dietary supplements and does not reflect foods with probiotics, so yogurt, sauerkrauts, all that, or even in the case of PetSmart, different dog food brands that actually have probiotics in them, including uh, different soft chews that you could give your, give your dog. So within one mile of where we're sitting right now, these are all the different probiotic options that she could choose from if she left your clinic at this point. And there are so many. And it starts at such a young age. So even, you can have prenatal probiotics that are specifically designed for pregnant women. Therefore, when your child is born, they can start the world with the best possible microbiome that you can imagine. But if you were late and didn't take them while you were pregnant, don't worry, because there are baby ones, or infant ones, or toddler ones that you can catch up and correct your mistake if that microbiome isn't quite perfect. And then if you're really late and you get it to your child, don't worry. Again, so many different probiotic options specifically designed just for kids. Women, oh yeah, they've got many different specific probiotic varieties. But men, don't worry. There are plenty that are available exclusively for you. If you happen to be over 50 years old, don't worry. You've got scores of different options just specifically designed for people over 50 years old. And what if you need them for, let's say, colon health or digestive support? Don't worry, there are specifically designed probiotics. What if you need something else? What if you need stuff for urinary health or immune defense or if you want to set weight management or sleeping problems or a probiotic specifically designed for travel? 
or my favorite, your stress and mood balance probiotic. Many different options you could potentially choose from. And if you're not a big fan of taking capsules, don't worry. They come in beads. They come in drinks. They come in chews. They come in chocolate bites. They come in sticks. Sti they come in powder. They come in different meal. They come in gummies. They come in chewables. come in yogurt and even energy drinks. So you have a lot of different ways in which to choose your probiotic. If you went to PetSmart and you were trying to find stuff for your dog or cat, don't worry. Here are options. This is a bacon-flavored probiotic that you can give dogs. <laughs> And then if you elect to choose a particular brand, let's say you got over that hurdle, well then do you choose one that's 25 billion colony forming units? Or maybe you need a little bit more, maybe you go over 50 billion. Or maybe you need extra strength, 100 billion. Or maybe you need extra, extra strength with 150 billion. Maybe you want a probiotic with just one species, like a Lactobacillus rhamnosus GG. Or maybe you need a Saccharomyces. Or maybe you just want a Bacillus. Maybe you want a probiotic with just one particular organism but maybe you want one with four, or maybe you want one with 12. Maybe you want probiotics with prebiotics, which is essentially food for your probiotics. So you get up in the morning and you can feed your children, you can feed your pets, and then you can make sure you feed the bacteria that are in your gut. <laughs> maybe you want them in a, a type of food, so maybe you get kefir, or maybe you have any yogurts or different milks. And maybe you spend $1.99 on your probiotics, or maybe you spend $59.99 on your probiotics. So the point of this is, is that what does this patient do when she goes to the store? Does she get something that's age specific? Does she get something that's sex specific? Maybe a symptom management or comorbidity management. So maybe that urinary tract one seems appealing for her. Are more colonies better? Well, this seems like a, a bad UTI. So maybe if I take 150 billion colony for me, that would be better. What about more species? 12 is greater than four, that's probably helpful. Are the pills better than the food? What if you really like sauerkraut and yogurt? And then are the $50 probiotics better than the $5 probiotics? So when we tell patients, sure, it's reasonable to try probiotics, if we don't know the answers to these questions, how can we expect the patients to be making informed decisions about what they, can, what they purchase? And I really don't think you can. And the industry is really growing. This is an NIH study from a couple years back looking at adults who've been exposed to probiotics. And just shy of 4 million United States uh, people here um, have been exposed to probiotics within the last month. The same thing is, is uh, found in children as well, too, just shy of uh, 300,000. If someone's looking to invest, probiotics is the industry to get into. The compound annual growth rate is over 7%. Uh, uh, last year it was over $40 billion. It's projected to get up to $65 billion. People are buying these. Whether or not we ask if they are, they're doing it. There's a long history of probiotics that really extend way before our understanding of the microbial world. Um, in human history, when we started going from hunters and gatherers into farmers, we started to use fermentation as a way to uh, uh, make different foods and to store them safely. Um, and uh, we have a lot of experience with it. Um, looking at yogurt, yogurt was uh, oftentimes first created around Turkey in the Middle East. And what, we, what, what they would do is they would use the milk of a particular um, animal, and then they would store that milk in the uh, stomach and the intestines where it would get bathed in the enteric flora of the animal after it was butchered. And that fermentation that allowed actually created yogurt. And even thousands of years ago, um, there was evidence that people uh, felt better on yogurt. They thought they had better digestive support, and they thought they were able to have... Um, improvement and avoiding certain types of infections. And this is even reflected in Egyptian hieroglyphics around the same time. So there's a long history with the idea of using probiotics, or at least the fermentation product, to have health benefits. So we still obviously use fermented foods today, and a lot of our patients might be asking these things. So are all fermented foods equal? And the answer is certainly not. There are some fermented foods that still have live cultures in them, like yogurt, some cheeses, sauerkrauts. And then there are foods that are fermented without live culture. So these are most beers, most wines, most breads, and most chocolates. This is the probiotic debut in the scientific literature. This is in 1922, so almost 100 years ago. And um, it was a really interesting time in microbiology because now the capabilities of growing organisms were really starting to flourish. Different labs uh, were able to, to find new organisms and analyze where they're present and where they're not. And essentially, this is lactobacillus. It says bacillus acidophilus. This is now lactobacillus. Um, 
patients, uh, clinicians gave lactobacillus sapidophilus to a subset of, group of people, I think it was around 20 patients or so, who had eczema. And they realized that their eczema actually improved while being on a probiotic. And this was incredible. And people really thought that this was a magic pill. And after this study, what people did was really start investigating other disease states, looking at who had low lactobacillus levels. And a disease state that was noted to have a low lactobacillus level was uh, psychosis in a mental hospital close by. And um, essentially what people did is they, they checked their stools and noticed that these people admitted with psychosis had low lactobacillus levels. And this was great. This was an organic etiology for mental health disease. And people said, well, let's give them lactobacillus and therefore will cure their mental illness. Well, this is really the first article that challenged that. And they said that if you look at mental institutions and patients with psychosis, well, maybe that was just one institution that had low lactobacillus levels. In this one, well, we found patients that had normal levels of, quote unquote, normal levels of lactobacillus. And when we gave them more, they had no the benefit. So even early on, there was this idea of these probiotics. Are these magic pills that can fix problems? Or are these complete garbage and a load of waste? And the same debate continues 100 years later. So there have been some changing definitions of probiotics with time. Uh, probiotics really come from the Greek pro and uh, uh, Latin for bios for life, or vice versa, rather. Um, and it really was opposed to antibiotics. So obviously, you're giving uh, live bacteria instead of killing them. And really, it was used early on in the animal industry in order to get increased growth. So what kind of probiotic can we give to make our pigs fatter, our cows bigger, so we can uh, have a, a uh, more meat to sell. But starting in the uh, 1980s, 1990s, more humans started using probiotics for other health benefits. And in 2001, the World Health Organization started to define them in a definition that we really use today, which are live microorganisms which, when administered in adequate amounts, confer a health benefit on the host. But there are a few other definitions that go along with probiotics that we should be familiar with. There are prebiotics, this is what I mentioned earlier about being food for probiotics. So, so these are non-digestible polysaccharides and oligosaccharides that promote the growth of probiotics. Um, and there are symbiotics, which is the combination of both pre- and post uh, and uh, probiotics. And then postbiotics, these are essentially products developed in the fermentation process. So tonight, if anybody has any beer or wine, they're going to be enjoying the benefits of postbiotics. When you look at the history of probiotics in the literature, um, it's not surprising, but it really is exponentially increased. Over here on this side, this is the amount of total publications and randomized control studies that were performed over the course of different decades. And now if you look, we're reaching that point now that we're, pro we're publishing randomized control studies um, and uh, publications at the same level over a year or two that we would see in decades and year past. So people are really interested in this, uh, both in basic science research and in uh, clinical research. What are people publishing on? Well, uh, almost pick any sort of pathology that you can imagine, and people are studying it with probiotics. The vast majority of these things are, are things that we would consider uh, more common, like diarrhea or uh, gut issues like IBS or inflammatory bowel disease. But even things like um, sepsis, dental infections, obesity, all have a, a large part of the probiotic literature. So this one wasn't really quite erased. But how did the FDA, uh, FDA categorize probiotics? Oop. Food, medical food, dietary supplements, drugs, or biological products. Yeah, I think this is an interesting question because um, you could really make the argument that probiotics could fit anywhere. Right? So food, obviously, right? there's yogurts, there's sauerkraut, that could fit. What about medical food? So these are things like oral rehydration products or different types of formulas. Well, there's formula that has probiotics in it. That, would, that could potentially be a, a, a fit. Dietary supplements are where the vast majority of probiotics fall. But what about drug? So many of our probiotic research is investigating to see if it does mitigate or prevent different diseases. So certainly, I think a lot of physicians are considering probiotic as a drug. And then obviously, biological products itself, they're live organisms. So probiotics, I think, are unique in that they really can fit into any of these categories. With that said, the vast, vast, vast majority of these things are marketed as dietary supplements. And the reason why that is is 
probably from an uh, economic standpoint and an ease standpoint. So no approval is needed before marketing and manufacturing of dietary supplements. Manufacturers need not provide the FDA with any evidence of safety or purported benefits. And they can make claims about the product, how it affects the structure and the function of the body, but they cannot make health claims. So they can't make specific comments like it reduces the risk of a certain disease. But why don't we market, or why doesn't the industry market probiotics as a drug? Well, I think the answer is obvious, is that if it were to be marketed as a drug, it'd have to undergo the same regulatory process as any drug, which means proof of safety and efficacy, and that takes time and money. So there's little motivation to do that. So what are some of these marketing claims that uh, you might see on a probiotics bottle? Well, you might say, say, see things like, for overall digestive and immune health. Or you might hear, overall digestive health and wellness. Or it might say, works naturally with your child's body. Supports mood and relaxation. Supports vaginal and urinary health. And they use strong words like fortify and promote. But other times it's more even keeled, like keeping things balanced. And then they have seemingly antagonistic words like restore and yet maintain on the same ones. So essentially, um, all of these things that people are reading, of course, none of them have been evaluated by the FDA in, in any sense. And what's the goal of probiotics? What are we trying to do? Well, it's trying to uh, create a microbiome that is, um, uh, allows you to have the best possible health benefits. But this is an incredibly complex environment. So if we think about how there's logarithmic differences between how many microbial cells and how many human cells in our body, it's really a very complex environment that is uh, really hard to feel like you un have a great understanding of, of, of how it works. I love this study. This was a study that was done in the 1990s that looked at the concentration of prokaryotic life on the planet. Okay, so not just in animals, on the planet. And prokaryotes in the human colon are higher than any other animal in the world. And the concentration of the human colon was compared to ocean water, fresh water, swamp water, and even the soil of tropical rainforests. And still, the human colon has the most concentration of prokaryotes anywhere on this planet, which is remarkable when you think about it, remarkable. Um, so the complexity of the microbiome is so vast, and I, I would argue is really hard for us to know at this point. What is the general microbiome? What does the general microbiome look like? You know, some of the papers will, will talk about how each individual has their own microbiome as a fingerprint. And you could really tell a lot about somebody. But generally, uh, things like uh, enteric flora, like the E. coli's of the world, have a large part of it. And then, you know, clostridia, this is also different spirochetes, uh, bacilli, all have a, a minority role to play. So really, what I'm trying to paint the picture is that your microbiome is essentially a human ecosystem for all sorts of different organisms, thinking of the same way in a macroscopic level and, and the world as being an ecosystem as well. So one uh, analogy that you can make is that your microbiome being exposed to antibiotics is like an ecosystem that has a dam that's put up. So all of a sudden the dam gets put up, there's drought, and maybe certain types of animal species die. And what happens is that you know these species that were able to still survive are able to propagate, maybe at higher levels, and weren't necessarily intended to by nature. So the idea of us trying to restore this uh, original ecosystem by reintroducing certain types of species um, could look like a, what a probiotic does. But this post-probiotic post doesn't necessarily equal the same thing as prior to the dam was placed for this ecosystem. And I think there are some parallels that you can make um, uh, in the global area with probiotics too. So this is an article regarding this uh, brown tree snakes, which stuck on boats and were able to land in Guam. And essentially what these brown tree snakes have done, they're an invasive species, they've eaten all sorts of the Guam native birds. So one idea and to get rid of these, one invasive species was to drop poison mice from parachutes that have already been killed that would land in the trees and then the, and then the snakes would eat these poison mice and die and your invasive species would get better. Well the problem is, is that other species on Guam who are in fact, uh, natural to the area, also ate the mice, so they had some death too. So it's not necessarily just by the addition of something can you restore your own uh, ecosystem. Same thing we always hear about these pythons and the Everglades, and this invasive species. This is an incredibly interesting uh, piece of evidence, and there are parallels with the uh, probiotic microbiome as well, in that 
this is a, a python that has evidence of DNA of local snakes. So clearly there is some breeding that's going on with the local snake and the python community, and you're creating this you know, python local snake hybrid in the Everglades, and what are the implications of these things? So taking a, a step back at the moment, what are the ideal properties of a probiotic? What would we like, the, the, if we were to design the best probiotic, what would it be? Well, first we need it to get to the target organ, which is uh, usually the gut. And of course, that means getting through the high acid levels of the stomach. So something like Lactobacillus acidophilus, or lover of acid, would have no problem getting there. And a lot of the probiotics that we see, the bifidobacteriums, lactobacilli, have been proven time and again that if you do take them, they can end up in the stools, but not only in the stools, but also in the gut mucosa. So a lot of the, the probiotics that we use certainly can get to that area. We want them to interact with the host systems. We don't just want them to sit there, but we want them to interact in a way that you have a benefit and also at the same time being incredibly safe and easy to manufacture. So if you were to create an ideal probiotic, it would have all of these characteristics. So if you, we'll go into some of these studies in a bit, but how are investigators choosing what probiotics they use? Well, a lot is very similar to that initial studies in the 1920s where there are microbiome epidemiologic studies. So maybe you find out in a certain disease state there are low amounts of a particular bacteria. Let's try to restore them. Or maybe there's some basic science research. There's research that lactobacillus uh, can interfere with uh, gut translocation of gram-negative rods. Well, maybe let's use lactobacillus to investigate things like neonatal sepsis. Or maybe people have done before, or maybe there's a relationship with the industry or availability of particular probiotics. So let's take our second case. There's a 68-year-old male with a history of alcoholic cirrhosis who comes to the TLC following liver transplantation. Prior to the surgery, he was admitted with hepatic encephalopathy, VRE peritonitis, and renal insufficiency. The surgery was uncomplicated. Following his procedure, he has an ET tube, an arterial line, a subclamian triple lumen, two peripheral IVs, a Foley catheter, and an NG tube. He is currently on piperacillin tazobactam, daptomycin, and mycofungin. His induction immunosuppression includes basiliximab, dexamethasone, tacrolimus, and mycophenolate. You mentioned that we want to do everything we can to avoid infection. And a medical student asks if we should start probiotics. You say, yes, let's start Lactobacillus rhamnosus GG with a prebiotic. No, he's got bigger fish to fry than C. diff. No, I worry about the risks associated with probiotics. This is a guy in the ICU, transplant, ton of lines. Or No, I don't think they work. If you were designing somebody at risk for infection, this would really, this would kind of fit the bill a lot of times. But actually, this is a patient that there's really a lot of growing excitement that probiotics could potentially be helpful. And there's a few reasons for this. I mentioned there is some good basic science data that certain types of gram-positive um, probiotics can limit bacterial translocation. Other types of probiotics can stimulate epithelial growth, motility, and mucus secretion. And then others even can increase immunity via uh, IgA uh, production and decrease inflammatory cytokines. So these characteristics really could be appealing for a surgical patient who is going through a lot of issues with the gut mucosal wall, has a lot of issues with healing and gram negatives, gram positive. This could, this could potentially be helpful. So there have been many different studies investigating post-surgical outcomes in patients receiving probiotics. And this is a meta-analysis of 31 randomized control trials using pro uh, uh, probiotics or even symbiotics. And eventually what was found was that there's a reduction in surgical site infections, a reduction in pneumonias, and a reduction in sepsis in patients in hospital stay. But overall there was no significant reduction in mortality in different groups. So there is some growing data that in surgical patients, infections will go down if you use probiotics. And this is not exclusive to just a general surgical patient. This is actually a, a, a paper that was a review paper that was published by here uh, was at Wisconsin with our transplant team, pharmacy and, and hepatology. And sorry that you guys can't really see this. Should have thought better. But um, essentially they reviewed uh, five different studies looking at probiotics in the post-liver transplant population and they found statistical significance of decreased uh, infectious risks with their exposure. If you were to think of somebody else that would be a really incredibly immune compromised person at high risk for infection, you'd really think of a NICU baby. This photo here is to remind everybody in internal medicine what a premature baby might look like. 
Um, and so neonatal enterocolitis um, is another area where there's potential evidence of having uh, better gut healing, better uh, limits of gram-negative rod translocation, and uh, different meta-analyses have looked to find that there is a benefit for using probiotics. This was a really exciting article that came out uh, just within the last couple of years looking at probiotics as a way to prevent neonatal sepsis and death in a low-income uh, setting. So this is in rural India, and they enrolled over 4,500 infants, and they exposed them to lactobacillus uh, plantarum, and they gave them 1 billion uh, colony-forming units of this a day and, uh, versus placebo. And what they found was pretty startling that there was not only a re risk reduction in sepsis, but also death. And the number needed to treat was 27 to find a benefit. That's really remarkable when you think about the numbers needed to treat for some of our other interventions. And also considering that the entire course of probiotic, the cost of it, was $1. So for $27, you can prevent an episode of neonatal sepsis or death is a remarkable finding that essentially really maybe only rivals vaccinations as a cost-effective way in low-risk settings uh, to uh, have a benefit. So I'm going to try to tackle this monster, and I purposefully did not put any kind of mid-ground that people could cop out in. So are you a believer that probiotics can help prevent C. diff diarrhea, or are you a skeptic? You don't think that they have any I didn't know what, I, what people were going to vote for here. So yeah, it seems like the majority think that they're helpful. Um, let's take a little bit of a dive into the probiotic literature and the current recommendations and the history behind these current recommendations. So there have been a lot of randomized controls trials looking at probiotics uh, relationship with C. diff. But like many studies, these are all very small studies. They're oftentimes using different species of probiotic based on different exposures of patients. And the settings of the C. diff rates at different institutions might be really high or it might be really low. And so it's really hard to get good general information if they can be helpful or not. So this is one of the first meta-analyses that tried to take a look at are probiotics helpful in C. diff. And what they found is that, it, yes, it actually favors the probiotic group, that it is helpful in reducing the risk of C. diff. So this is great. This is great. In 2010, the first infectious disease, or, not, or one of the infectious disease society guidelines about C. diff was published after this meta-analysis. And essentially what they said is that it's not recommended to prevent primary C. diff because there's insufficient data. And they made the point that larger trials are required before this practice can be recommended. They thought that, that a lot of the trials that, or a couple of the trials that were really pushing it in the probiotic as a benefit side or large trials in, uh, or sorry, small trials, but in high C. diff incident right, uh, settings. So you couldn't necessarily make parallels to the general population or public. So they challenged the scientific community to, to have better trials. So a better trial comes out. A couple of years later, this was uh, uh, the biggest C. diff probiotic study that had been published at the time. And it was over uh, just shy of 3,000 patients enrolled at five different sites in the UK. Everybody was over 65. Everybody was immunocompetent, and they gave lactobacillus acidophilus and two species of bifidobacterium every day for 21 days after being exposed to antibiotics. And what they found was that it made no difference at all, not just with C. diff, but also with antibiotic-associated diarrhea. So the conclusions that they made is that they see no evidence that a multi-strain preparation of lactobacillus and bifidobacterium was effective in preventing antibiotic-associated diarrhea or C. diff. Some of the uh, critics of this study made a couple arguments. One is that the overall rates of C. diff here had the opposite problem. In both groups, they were really low. So if some of the early studies had really high rates of C. diff here, it was really low. Maybe you don't have the right setting to really answer this question yet. Another critique about this is that the patients were not randomized in any way concerning diet. So all of the people in the no probiotics group could have been taking milk and sauerkraut or yogurts every single day, and that could have potentially had an impact on this. And we don't know because there was no uh, random, or there, that was not uh, um, uh, something that was excluded. So after that study came out, another meta-analysis was, was performed, including this one. 
And yet, even with that negative finding, they still thought that there was probably a little bit of favoring of, uh, of, of placebo, or excuse me, of, of probiotic over placebo. Um, and uh, people still weren't sure, so a Cochrane review came out. And essentially, they looked at 31 trials, including the old ones and the new ones, and they thought that there was moderate certainty that probiotics are effective for preventing C. diff diarrhea. So when the new C. diff guidelines in 2017 came out, in the setting of these bigger studies, in the setting of a couple of these meta-analysis and Cochrane reviews that were produced, they said the same thing. There's insufficient data at this time to recommend any administration of probiotics for primary prevention. I've had the opportunity to discuss this with uh, one of the members on the, on the board of the, uh, of the guidelines, and essentially um, there was no quorum at all. They, they really could not, they, there were some people who were believers in the group and some people who really weren't. And ultimately, the, the point that a lot of people were concerned about was that the study settings, C. diff rates were either too high or too low, and they didn't think that you could make any kind of general terms uh, overall um, for the rest of the public. And C. diff, or any probiotic study, is really hard because there are just so many variables that researchers have to consider. So there are probiotic variables. Well, maybe if they were using lactobacillus rhamnosus, they should have been using lactobacillus acidophilus, or maybe another uh, genus entirely. Maybe the dose was enough. Maybe they do need that 150 billion units that you can get over at GNC. What about the frequency? Maybe you need to take it twice a day versus daily, or the duration. Maybe if you continued things longer, you would have a better impact. Or the patient itself. What if probiotics really aren't helpful for diabetics or for liver patients or for any kind of comorbidity? What if there's different types of antibiotic exposures that would put someone at a risk? These studies didn't really factor that in. So maybe if you took a fluoroquinolone, you have a better benefit than if you took a beta-lactamase, beta beta-lactam, beta-lactamase inhibitor. We don't, we don't know that. Um, and what about the patient's own microbiota? Right? So maybe there are certain microbiota characteristics that would really be beneficial to be exposed to probiotics. What about the environmental variables? So of course the C. diff rate that we're talking about, but what about the microbiota of other household contacts? All right? what, are the, what are they being exposed to? And of course diet. So how do you factor in all of these variables to make a, a, a study that's really standardized across groups? And the point is I don't really think you can. It's really challenging to do. And I think that uh, really limits a lot of... Uh, um, interpretation on, on, on some of these studies. And this is not unique to C. diff. I'm going to quickly just go through something that's a little bit unrelated from C. diff at all, and it's eczema. So to get a sense of just all the various different studies of eczema and the erase of probiotics. So here's one with 38 adults who were given lactobacillus salivarius, and they were given it for, for um, 1 billion for 16 weeks, right? And it showed improvement. Great. It works. Here's another one that gave it to 24 adults with bifidobacterium, and it gave it for uh, 10 billion units daily for eight weeks. And yes, it works. That's great. Here's one that was for babies. They gave it to 102 of them. They gave lactobacillus rhamnosus GG, and they found no therapeutic effect uh, for babies with eczema. And they were giving it to them for 12 weeks as the infant. But here's one that gave the same probiotic to babies, but they were giving it to mom. And mom would take it and then excrete it into the breast milk, and then babies would be exposed to it that way. So the point of all these things are is that when you read things, like even the Cochrane reviews and the meta-analyses, they use all these different randomized control trials in the same setting. So obviously, we've got four different studies that are asking, are probiotics helpful for the treatment of eczema? And we're talking about different patient populations, different ages, different bacterial strains, different dosing, different administration. It's very challenging. I think at all, can you compare them against one another to get an actual answer? And not surprisingly, when you look at a lot of these things, it says it makes little or no difference because we're trying to compare studies that I would argue oftentimes shouldn't be compared. There have some, been some recent high-profile negative studies with probiotics that have made its way into the lay press, and you'll see all sorts of uh, comments like the probiotics money down the toilet, are they ineffective, the problem with probiotics. I'm going to go through a couple of these real quickly. Two high-profile studies in the New England Journal that were published in December of this year looking at probiotics and gastroenteritis for children and found that two different strains had no impact in the overall severity for it. And then this one here, too. This was something that came out in Cell. This was a really interesting article where they looked at patients, healthy patients, volunteers. They gave them antibiotics. 
prior to giving them antibiotics, they looked at their microbiome, not just in their stools, but they actually took mucosal biopsies as well, too. Then they gave them antibiotics, and there were a few different groups. One group they gave probiotics to. Another group they gave um, auto fecal microbiota uh, transplants. And a third group they did nothing. And what they found essentially was that the restoration of the microbiome in the probiotic group was the slowest. So doing nothing was better. If your goal essentially was to restore your microbiome, doing nothing was better than giving probiotics. And this really kind of changed a lot of people's perspectives or at least highlighted the problems uh, with it. Because if our goal is to restore microbiomes, the addition of lactobacillus uh, is not going to necessarily be enough to do it. Now, a critique of this study is that, well, it wasn't designed to look at clinical efficacy, and that's true. So we don't necessarily know if the patients who did get the lactobacillus had less rates of C. diff than the others. But if our goal or if our question is, are we restoring a microbiome with uh, some of these probiotics, the answer could be no. In fact, we might be uh, having deleterious effects on them. This is, again, the example of your microbiome. So what? They can't hurt, might be an argument. Well, is that true? This is my favorite dog probiotic. It's a multi-strain probiotic. And I don't know if you guys can see this back there, but this is under the total live bacteria. So there's lactobacillus, lactobacillus, and then Enterococcus faecium. So people who treat enterococcal infections, there's a couple different ones, but this is the one that we really fear. This is the one that oftentimes is VRE. This is the one that oftentimes causes endocarditis. It's really hard for us to clear from the bloodstreams, causes invasive disease. So when I saw this on the back of a dog probiotic list, this really you know, gave me pause. And certainly will be a next question I ask somebody who's got VRE that I can't determine where they got it from. <laughs> are they giving their dog probiotics? So there are some safety concerns. And there have been certain studies that have tried to estimate what are the safety concerns on a global scale. This was a study that looked at um, European uh, probiotic use, and they estimate that a one case of lactobacillemia occurs in every 1 to 10 million healthy patients who take it. And they say that this is also the same rate of lactobacillemia that you would see in patients without probiotic exposure. So they make the claim that for healthy hosts, there is no risk, increased risk for lactobacillemia compared to uh, not being exposed to it. There are some theoretical concerns about probiotics regarding horizontal gene transfer between different organisms. So obviously these organisms are, are interacting with others uh, in the gut, and what's, what's the effect of it? Lactobacillus itself has um, resistance to uh, vancomycin. It's intrinsic resistance. They can't use it to treat it. But we found evidence that the VAN-A gene that we see in VRE can get transmitted to lactobacillus. So um, even though we wouldn't use Vanco to treat it, we have evidence now that these types of plasmids are going back and forth. And it also goes the other way, too, where lactobacillus have been found to have uh, tetracycline plasmids and have given that to enteric flora. So our, this is very similar to that situation I had earlier of, of maybe the invasive species, the snake and the Everglades, starting to share genetic material with the, with the native organisms that's there. So while we still think that this is a, a theoretical risk on a clinical side, there certainly is basis for this in basic science. A study that you might have heard about or you'll ha hear people re uh, reference a lot regarding the dangers of probiotics is this uh, essentially probiotics in the setting of pancreatitis. So like some of those surgical patients I mentioned before, these are really sick patients that have a high risk of infection. So uh, in around 2008, a study uh, uh, occurred and, um, looking at will probiotics decrease the risk of infection in these pancreatitis patients. And just shy of 300 patients were randomized to receive either lactobacillus acidophilus, um, KCI salivarius, bifidobacterium, a whole combination, and they gave it to them 10 billion colony forming units a day. And if they, after they were, oops, sorry. And essentially what they found um, was that they um, increased morbidity. There were nine deaths in the probiotic group compared to zero in the non probiotic group. And eight of those nine deaths related to gut ischemia. So the authors postulated that they weren't quite certain, but was there something about the probiotics that we were giving that increased the likelihood of gut ischemia in this group? 
So maybe they're not just completely safe and we, we don't need to think of them um, as being potential harms. I think that they're, they're certainly are, are, are concerns. What are people doing at other institutions? Well, this is a study from the CDC looking at 145 different hospitals throughout the US. And of the 145, 139 had probiotics on formulary. Um, a vast majority of hospitals are giving them out. And you can see there's a wide range of different ones that uh, different hospitals use. A lot are based on just what's available in the formulary. Here is um, Hospital in Toronto, Toronto Sick Kids. They are uh, big proponents of probiotics in their neonatal ICU, and they publish their, their um, uh, guidelines for its use in these preemies, and it's very well published that they are very um, satisfied with it and big proponents of it. And yet there are other institutions that feel completely the opposite. So at Hopkins, there's a complete ban on probiotics, not just in the formulary, but patients cannot even bring their own probiotics into the hospital. So this is a dramatic departure from giving it to your neonatal intensive care unit. So there really is some variety. So what do we have here? What describes UW's probiotic policy? Do we, uh, is it prohibited? Can they only be used if it's the patient's own supply? Are there no restrictions on probiotics within UW? Is there a specific probiotic protocol that pharmacists can add probiotics to eligible patients uh, without a physician's orders? Or are physicians encouraged to order probiotics on uh, eligible patients receiving antibiotics? So the answer really is D. There's actually a probiotic protocol in place that pharmacists can add probiotics to eligible patients. And where we see this is on the hospital services, the family practice services, and the general med services in patients that are adults that do not have um, certain types of uh, immune deficiencies. Um, and the pharmacists can order themselves if they had uh, certain exposures to beta-lactam, beta-lactamase inhibitors, clindamycin, fluoroquinolones, um, carbapenems, or other high-risk antibiotics. And this protocol has been used 7,888 times uh, over the last two years and given over 70 doses of probiotics. The probiotic that we have on formulary is the lactobacillus rhamnosus GG, and what we give is um, 10 billion colony-forming units a day. Our oral intake is preferred over enteric tubes, so we'd like people to be able to swallow them. And the reason that is, is that if you had it in a tube, like an NG tube or an NJ tube, you have to open up the probiotic. And if you open up the probiotic, that's live organism. So uh, there's a higher risk of being able to contaminate lines, cause bloodstream infections. So nurses are really advised to use sterile technique if they have to use enteric tubes, and they should be doing this in the med room and not at the patient's bedside. So, um, I want to show you a little bit about the antibiotic milieu that we're exposing our patients to here. So these are the rates of clindamycin over the last couple years. These are the rates of the fluoroquinolones, and you can see they've dropped pretty dramatically after the fluoroquinolone restriction has come on. Those are second-generation cephalosporins, kind of stayed steady. Our third-generation cephalosporins, like ceftriaxone, have gone up in the setting of decreased fluoroquinolone use, which makes sense. Um, this was uh, our cefepime, essentially. And you might remember a few years back, there was a zosin shortage, which is why the zosin numbers are down and the cefepime numbers were high. And here's our carbapenems. And so here, this is the antibiotics that we expose to patients. So in the setting of that, what are our probiotic numbers? Well, here are our probiotics. So if you look here in, um, in fall of 2016, that's when the, the pharmacy protocol really kicked off. And then after you know, a year or two, not that there was any problems, but just it kind of waned. You know, people kind of forgot about it. And we stopped doing it as regularly. So we had to readdress this on the antimicrobial stewardship uh, committee. And what we were looking at is that this is really interesting because we've got a pre-intervention, an intervention, and then almost a post-intervention here. Can we look to see if there's any changes in C. diff testing or C. diff rates that might get us an answer about our probiotic use here at UW? Well, here are all the C. diff tests that have occurred. And essentially what you find is that there's no statistical difference at all, pre-intervention, intervention, or post-intervention with how readily we're checking for C. diff. These are our hospital-acquired cases of C. diff, and they are certainly down from a, a couple of years ago. However, this is also in the setting of the fluoroquinolone restriction. So I really think that some of the improvements that we're seeing are due to the fact that we're not prescribing fluoroquinolones as readily rather than the use of these probiotics, but I honestly don't know that for sure. 
So this essentially, when faced with this data, we said, do we continue this protocol? Do we stop this protocol? And we elected to continue it. Um, and a big reason why we elected to continue that is that we think it's safe here at UW. Why do we think it's safe at UW? Well, we've looked at all the bloodstream infections for the last couple of years. And we found 13 lactobacillus bloodstream infections, which certainly seems a lot higher than that one to t out of every one to 10 million people that that European study was, was mentioning. So I want to just take a look at these lactobacillus uh, uh, bloodstream infections quickly. Um, you can see that there's a various different amount of what ultimately the species type was. The vast majority of them were in immune compromised patients, which included solid organ transplant recipients, including one liver, cancer on chemotherapy, bone marrow, people on chronic prednisone. And of those 13, 11 were exposed to, pro and, uh, to probiotics. Seven were exposed to rab lactobacillus rhamnosus, the same probiotic that we give here at UW, excuse me, at UW. And others were exposed to different strains. Some were polymicrobial. So let's say you're taking probiotic and then your gut perfed. Well, you had all, all sorts of different organisms that could be in your, your, your bloodstream, so it's not particularly surprising that one of the probiotics might be one of them. But I was really interested in the monomicrobial infections. So same thing, gut perfed, and we just had a lactobacillus on a couple patients. Again, I can almost see why that might happen. And these line-related ones were pretty interesting. And we don't have any sense about how uh, these patients, when they came into the hospital, how they were giving their probiotics with their line. Were they washing their hands beforehand? What kind of contact? And this cryptic one was the one that I'm really interested in. This was a 65-year-old gentleman that has a history of just diabetes. No other types of immune compromised state who came in in sepsis, was brought into the TLC, put on pressors, improved dramatically with the initiation of antibiotics, and two out of two blood cultures both grew lactobacillus rhamnosus. No other explanation in the gut could be determined, and it was really thought that this was a bloodstream infection secondary to probiotic use. This strain was finger -typed, fingerprint, and it matched the same strain as the probiotic that he was taking at home. So he did fine. They gave him antibiotics, and he was ready to go home. And if you look at his discharge uh, med rec list, the same probiotics were asked to continue that when he left the hospital. We haven't seen him again. I don't know if he's taken it or not, but um, I thought that was peculiar that uh, that wasn't discontinued. But something that I want to bring up is, um, you know, some of these bloodstream infections, you know, about a third of them end up in the ICU. And if you look at a 30-day all-course mortality, it's at 30%, which really rivals our MRSA, bacteremia all-cause mortality at the same time, which is 24%. So maybe these things are more serious than we are giving them credit to. But if you look at each of those patients that I presented, each of these patients had the bloodstream infection upon admission. Okay, so therefore, none of these were nosocomial lactobacillus bacteremias. And because of that, I can strongly make this claim that of that 7,388 patients that we've given it to, we've had zero bloodstream episodes attributed to the probiotics we're giving here at our institution. And I think that the poor 30-day all-cause mortality likely reflects an overall poor protoplasm rather than any type of specific pathogen effect. Um, and it's certainly a small sample size. So, uh, you know, real quickly, I'm just curious if these numbers have changed at all. How would you describe yourself now? Are you a believer? Are you a skeptic? Or are you just as agnostic as you've ever been before? Not really quite sure. Wow, there's no new believers. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, there's a few. <laughs> you know, and... Um, I can certainly sympathize with that. So if we use Cochrane reviews as a, a way that we can analyze a lot of different studies, and I mentioned earlier why there's some problems with this in relation to probiotics, but let's just give them the benefit of the doubt. There are 24 different Cochrane reviews dedicated to probiotics, ranging from preterm morbidity and mortality to UTIs to necrotizing enterocolitis to C. diff to Crohn's disease, UC management, non-alcoholic fatty liver, a lot. A lot are there. And this is my Joe's not so grade A review on probiotic Cochrane reviews. I made my own scoring system. I'm happy to talk about this if anybody really wants to. I don't know how scientific it is. <laughs> but on this side, these are the magic pills where they're really helpful. And on this side, it's the low to right waste. So if we wanted to answer the question, are probiotics magic pills or are they loads of waste? I really don't think you can because if you do the math on that, it is right on this border under this insufficient evidence. 
So my final thoughts and conclusions is I really want to be a probiotic believer, but I'm not quite there yet. At the same time, I'm not ready to discount probiotics. I think there's too many variables. I really think in 20, 30 years, we'll have a better insight about microbiome, which specific types of probiotics people would benefit from, and that might be different from me, different to you, or different disease states. I think we should try to change our uh, vocabulary a little bit, and the people ask, are probiotics good or are probiotics bad? Are they a waste of time? I think we have to ask, what is the question that they're asking? Well, that's like saying, are antibiotics good or are all drugs good? We need to be specific. So are probiotics helpful for the prevention of C. diff? That's one question, but I would even challenge you to go further. Are, is lactobacillus rhamnosus GG given for 21 days helpful in the, in the reduction of C. diff? Because we don't quite have a great sense of all the different variables that can go with different species. So be specific. I think I have since, since starting this, have taken a more proactive approach with my patients. Instead of them asking me if I should take probiotics or not, when I prescribe antibiotics, which is essentially all the time, I now ask them, are you considering taking probiotics? Because if they say no, or if they say yes, now I have a new frame of reference with how I can proceed. Because I want to discuss the conflicting evidence. I want to discuss the potential risks. And I want to be specific. And what I don't want to do is say, yeah, sure, take, maybe it'll help. Take some probiotics. And then someone spends $60 on taking probiotics and maybe not afford the other medication that they need or something else that's really important in their life. Lastly, I just want to leave you with, with two photos that I think really summarize uh, America's concern and, em and embrace of bacteria in the microbial world. These are probiotics that are directly next to the antibacterials <laughs> and microbial cleanses, which simultaneously expresses our love of all things natural and our fear of anything that could potentially harm us. So thank you guys very much. We have a couple minutes for questions, and please repeat the question. Hi. Hi. Um, I take a serious uh, probiotic, um, so I get Florigen, which you have to ask for at the pharmacy because they're refrigerated. So I always felt like that was like the real um, yeah. probiotic. Right. I guess the, the couple comments I just want to respond to about that first is you brought up the point about it being refrigerated, which is a really important point. So a lot of these studies that are going on and what probiotics buy, there are specific recommendations with how these things need to be stored and taken, and we have no sense if people are doing that or not. Right? So if you have to take something that needs to be refrigerated at a certain temperature, what if someone has it on the counter next to the rest of their Tylenol or aspirin? That would mean that it wouldn't necessarily be effective. And um, I think your experience with it really being helpful and feeling strongly about it is a very common experience that a lot of people have. Um, and again, there's a lot of problems with the Cochrane reviews with things. If you look at some of these Cochrane reviews overall with um, uh, vaginal yeast infections and prevention of UTIs, the data just really isn't great that it helps on a global scale. But I would never argue with somebody who says that really having benefits from it, they really feel well, because I think, again, there's probably subsets of people that do feel that way. And I, I would uh, ask them to continue one if they can, but not necessarily buy an expensive one or something else in that setting. So I, I think your experience is really a very frequent one that people have. Yeah. Um, you didn't say much about prebi prebiotics. Yeah. Yeah, good question. I don't know of that, but the, um, the question essentially was, uh, instead of taking 
prebiotics can you have diet that would influence your, your microbiome or your probiotics that you're taking and have therapeutic benefit from it. Um, I don't know of any of those particular studies based on the uh, absolute giant amount. I would imagine people have started to look into this. What I would say about, um, about uh, uh, some of these prebiotics and um, are is that uh, it seems that when you take prebiotics, um, a lot of studies show that the um, probiotic will stay in your stools for longer and that it's more likely to actually get into the mucosa itself rather than just pass through. So some thoughts are that prebiotics are really essential to have the probiotics flourish in that environment. And that certainly has been found in um, a lot of the surgical cases, liter surgical literature, and in the liver transplant, that prebiotics could potentially be helpful in, in some of those benefits that we're seeing. We'll take the rest up at the podium. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Yeah, appreciate it.